Brian asked me to come, um, originally said um, pediatrics and geriatrics. And then about an hour ago, I told him, you know, my pediatric lecture is about 140 slides and the geriatrics is 188 slides. He was like, eh, I don't think we'll be covering both of those tonight. Um, unless I have no problem. I just have to be at the hospital up for 7 a.m. So I can stay here for a while and talk and maybe 10, 11 o'clock and it might bore you guys enough. Um, so from the aspect, we decided to go with the, the pediatrics. Um, it is purely for the aspect. I think most people were really comfortable when it comes to geriatrics. I mean, from the aspect with the adults and all that stuff, or we're, I should say we're, we're more comfortable with the geriatric versus the pediatric. Um, maybe, maybe not. Technical difference. All right. So the, I borrowed this. I'm gonna say I stole it. Um, borrowed it off of a uh, website. This is from a pediatrician and all that stuff. Uh, roaming basically states that it's hardly ever good when the rescue is pulled to risk rate is greater than that of the pediatric patient. Um, I don't know if you guys ever read the book House of God. Um, great book. If you never have, short read. It's funny. It's hilarious. Um, and one of the rules, or they talk about in there, um, one of the rules of the house um, is the first pulse that you should check is your own, um, which is, you know, rightfully so and all that stuff. Um, it is a good plug. So taking call, the, taking control of the pediatric EMS call. Really, there's, you know, three things that kind of sort of, you know, starting off before we even, you know, start the call. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you're here right now. It's, it's part of the preparation and the practice side of it. Um, and then so much of, you know, into the perception, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the, the preparation, the practice, repeating things over and over again. Um, I ask a lot of questions, so it's just how I am. Um, so a pediatrics, one-year-old, weighs how much? You're going to a code. You just got a call. You're, you have a one-year-old cardiac arrest. How much, does that, in your mind, how much does that kid weigh? 15 kilos, okay. So weight pound wise, do you ever think about this? So I have a what's called a one five ten rule. So a one year old, a five year old, a ten year old is approximately 10, 20, 30. Now again, this might be you know I don't know you know Ayersville if they have a lot of bigger kids out here and all that stuff. <laughs> so. You, you, so you do have to kind of sort of take into consideration, you know, the size of the kid. So ideal body weight of what's based upon the bras low. Um, one, five, 10. So one year old, a five year old, 10 year old, it's approximately 10, 20, 30. So one year old is approximately 10 kilograms, a five year old is approximately 20, and a nine, 10 year old is approximately 30 kilograms. So thereby that, if you already know a weight, everything in pediatrics is weight based. Your angst and your anxiety is already, if you can just that and keep that in your mind, most everything else really falls into place. So part of the preparation, the practice, all right? What we're trying to do is trying to figure out ways to stop the chain from breaking. All right? Again, going through that whole rope over and over again, practicing. So on the prep side of it, um, or the prep, which is the first one is the practice, then you have response. Uh, equipment and then down, you know, the protocols and all that stuff. Um, and the only way you know, with protocols is reading them. Yeah, you know, I know it's a short read, but it's like, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. All right. So the same thing with the guidelines, the protocols and all that stuff. You can't sit there and read it. I've written it so many times. I know the guidelines. All right. And the only ways for you guys to get familiar with them is you know, take a page at a time, sit down on the toilet while you're walking, reading, whatever, you know, from that aspect. So using prep, basically half of it's team control, okay? Hopefully dispatch will give you guys some information. Otherwise, if you know it's a six-year-old, cardiac arrest, whatever, whatever, talk about it and we'll, you know, in a second, is start quizzing each other or start, if you're with your partner, really prepping yourselves, what are we to expect? What are we to speak? Okay, so much that you can do before you even get there. 
So we're going to do is we're going to talk about pediatrics. We'll talk about the assessment triangles, the, the non, what's called the non-accidental traumas, all right, your child abuse and all that stuff. Adjustment fevers, um, seizures, the in inconsolable crying child have mnemonic called so a bitch, um, which will help kind of sort of what to think about with that inconsolable child. Um, RSV croup, we're in that season now. Um, and then epiglottitis, it's there, but not there. Um, and a lot of it is because of the immunizations and the vaccinations that have occurred back in the 1980s. Um, so we don't see as much of epiglottitis, which is a good thing for us um, pre-hospital. I mean, there was a lot of sick kids that got intubated and all that stuff just because of this, you know, the, hip, the Haemophilus influenza um, bacteria and all that stuff. And again, any questions, stop me, talk. I have, we can talk about, go off topic and I don't care. So normal vital signs, all right. By the end of this, I expect you to memorize this. You'll be quizzed on it. Okay. And again, here it's really trends, okay. If you look at trends and you know, newborns, they breathe really fast, and as we get older, we don't breathe as fast. Heart rates are really fast, and then they're not quite as fast. Blood pressure are really low, and then they go up. So it's more along the lines of trends, and there's some different um, formulas out there that you can say, you know, 70 plus age is what the ideal, you know, newborn up until, or their age per month, um, plus 70 will give you your, your systolic blood pressure. Don't worry about that, okay? Really look at trends. Knowing that a newborn, he can be breathing up to 60 a minute, and that's normal, you know? Heart rates, 130s to 140s, up to 200s, and that's normal, okay? And then goes down. That's the biggest thing. So when you look at the kid, and when we talk about a little bit with the, um, the, the PAT, it's yes, the kid looks good, but he has a fast heart rate. He's breathing fast. Is that really a bad thing? Um, and again, just talk about the, the age and the weights and all that stuff. If you don't have a Braslow's, um, your one year old, your five, year, uh, your five and 10, again, just go back to reiterate your, your 10, 20, 30 rule. This has really saved my rear end many, many a times. I used to love Grey's Anatomy. I've watched it forever. Right. So I, whenever I lecture or whenever I give, you know, I always start off with a little bit on, you know, anatomy physiology. We've always forgotten it. You know, you pro some of you probably haven't dusted off the EMT book in a while. You know, over and over again. The only way I remember a lot of it is because of the lecture. So pediatrics, size, okay? They got big heads, little bodies, okay? Their neck's not as well developed. They have, don't have as much blood. They get their abdomen, their skin and all that stuff is really close. They have, they're lower to the ground, so they have problems with heat exchange. Um, so there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. Heads, 60%, okay? The majority of blunt injuries is the head. We know the, you know, the little, you know, the, your toddler that is just starting to walk, what happens to them? They trip, boom, okay? They take the face plant over and over again. That head is like the, the lawn dart, okay? <laughs> it's a projectile, and that's really what they go. Um, they have uh, not as thick skulls, so they're, uh, the problem there is the potential, especially with the fontanelles. Um, fontanelles don't close until the age of two, so the, the potential risk of damaging the brain itself more from the impact because the skull's not protecting it. Um, and then from there, smaller faces, which in turn uh, makes it difficult, you know, for our EMTs or our, our advanced EMTs or paramedics to be able to intubate. Next, they have a, a greater laxity. Again, smaller neck, big head, okay? The, all the, um, the spinous um, or the, the ligamentous processes and all that stuff are not working or they're not as strong. So what happens in a car accident? So you got big heads, small necks that with lax, okay? Car accident, crash, boom, what happens? Exactly, they got the bobblehead going, okay? 
this is one of the reasons why kids should be rear facing. Okay, uh, what is it? Twenty pounds in age of at least one or twenty-two pounds. It's been a little while. Okay. Um, and the, the Pediatric Association now is saying as long as the kid can be in a rear-facing car seat, that's the ideal, you know, until they outgrow it um, is really the ideal place because they, they look at, you know, what, you know, trying to prevent neck injuries in the kids and all that stuff. Um, always think about from the aspect uh, here when we talk about airways. Um, so the, if you lay their, their head down, they have a big occiput, so it's going to naturally, it's going to push the chin towards their chest. So you might have to put a pad or something or a towel roll even under their shoulder blades, okay, to help them for breathing and all that stuff. Or if you're going to be potentially intubating and all that. The ribs are more horizontal versus the adults. Our adults, they go um, at an angle. There's a uh, wrap around the body. They have small intercostals or the intercostal muscles aren't working as well. Um, and from there, the breathing side of it, okay, what's the largest muscle in our body or in the, the abdominal for breathing and all that stuff? The diaphragm, okay? They rely on the diaphragm for everything, okay? So how do kids, you know, what are kids predominantly called? Belly breathers, all right? They breathe with their belly because of the diaphragm and all that stuff. It's a bad sign or it's ominous sign when you see more of the chest and less of the belly in the kids and all that stuff. Um, Media sign is more uh, mobile. Um, and then from there, uh, thin chest walls, if you listen, you know, a lot of times you can hear upper, air, upper airway stuff from the nose coming down to the chest where it might sound like they're wheezing or might have rock eye and all that stuff just because of the, how everything is transmitted through. Cardiovascular heart rate, okay. Up until one to two, okay. Um, actually, going back to the, the chest and lungs. Um, one answer I forgot. They're ob what's called obligate nasal breathers. They usually see to about the age of one, right? Because most of the time, if you think, you know, pre-industrial time period, how did kids eat? What was their source of nutrition for infants? Nursing, okay, the breast, all okay. right. How do you eat and breathe at the same time? Through the nose, exactly. So to about one, if they have clogged nose and all that stuff, they can't breathe, which means they can't eat, all right. So a lot of times for them, when we talk about a little bit with the bronchiolitis, you, you get your six, seven year old this time period, when it's starting to get cold, RSV, non-RSV, bronchiolitis, they got the runny noses and all that stuff. If even the simplest thing of taking the blue bulb syringes and suctioning their nose out, it saves them, okay? You guys can cure a kid just by suctioning the nose. And then you're a hero. Mom pat you on the back. Yay, you saved my kid. So heart rate, um, they have a limited reserve. Um, we won't really talk about the, um, actually, we can. Um, cardiac output equals what? Told you, I quiz. Heart rate times, what? Stroke volume. All right, so stroke volume is the amount of blood that squirts out per beat, and of course, heart rate. Okay, so cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume is based on three things, preload, afterload, contractility. Different story, different topic, all right? Really, though, the biggest, they don't have a big heart, so they can't circulate a lot of blood. Of course, they don't have much blood anyways. So they get a very small amount of blood to be able to squirt through the heart. So how do they maintain their cardiac output? Through their heart rate. That's why kids... They can teeter at 180, 200 beats per minute for an hour's on end, okay? And then what happens though to them? They're done, okay? They crash, they crash fast and hard, all right? So be very careful and ominous. Again, you get a kid that's beating at 200 a minute. One, find out how long it's been going on and then prepare for the worst because it's going to happen. It's going to happen quick. 
Spreading calories is not a good thing. Um, it's usually due to lack of oxygen. Um, and then of course, with the blood pressure, they can hold it um, a little bit longer than adults. Um, and then from the aspect of the blood volume, um, larger, it's proportionally larger because they have smaller bodies that we'll talk to you in about a second. The absolute volume is, is lower. So a newborn, they have about a soda can, 12 ounces. Your 60 pound kid, which is about how, what age? 10, 11, okay, because 60 pounds, how do we get to kilograms? 2.2 or half, whichever one, okay, and then going back to our 1, 5, 10 rule, okay, so one year old is 10, five year old is, okay, nine, 10 year old, 30, okay, so 1, 5, 10, and that's about that, and then of course, you know, once we get to 125 pound adults, you know, all that stuff, you know, they, get a, they have a couple liters of blood. Small blood volumes, again, talk about the rapid blood control, um, and then they go, you know, the quickly through the, the sudden irreversible shot. So they're doing well, doing well, doing well, and then they step over the cliff and plummet, and you can't get them back. Blood pressure, again, from the aspect, you know, not always a good thing or be able to control. So what's a good way to measure how well their circulation, and we'll talk about this a little bit with, with the PAT. Look at them. Specifically, what are you looking for? Pink hormone drive. What else can you check for? Skin trigger, cap results. Okay. Okay. So in a black child, okay, where's another good place to look at? Sclera and gums under the tongue. Have them lift up their tongue. Look under the, the buccal mucosa and all that stuff. All that stuff, low consciousness, talk about that. Um, cap refill, just push it down and see how long it lasts. Um, ideally, it should be no more than less than two, okay? Respiratory, um, it's the whole aspect with the tidal volume, they, they have small lungs, um, small chest, so they can't take in as much, we know this. Um, and then from there, the oxygen demand um, is higher, okay? Heart rate is equivalent to metabolic demand. The faster our heart rate is, the faster our metabolic demand, our metabolic demand is. And that's one of the things that when I later, when I talk about different things like STEMIs, why in the guidelines we give medications to make patients not as anxious and not have as fast as a heart rate. Because if I can lower the heart rate down, I know that I don't, have, I don't need as much oxygen. Same thing with kids. If I can slow them down a little bit, don't have them breathe as fast, they're not going to have as much problems with needing the oxygen. Airways, again, big heads, octopus big, so it tilts the head forward. Okay, they have big tongues, small airways, small neck, which in turn leads to all the problems inside the, the airway and all that stuff. They get a, fluffy, a floppy epiglottis, which is omega shaped, um, and then the cricoid cartilage um, is the narrowest point. In the adult, what's the narrowest point? The vocal cords. Yep. So the vocal cords itself. So it's a little bit past the vocal cords, and this is one of the things we talk about ingestions a little bit later. Okay. Your little grape. Okay. They suck the grape. Where does it go? It gets past the vocal cord, and then it gets stuck. All right, I'm right in the cartilage and all that stuff. After mouth breathers, again, we talk about the obligate nasal breathers. Uh, neck overextension can sometimes cause problems with the glottis. Um, and then, you know, just opening their jaw, giving the good lift, head tilt, chin lift, grabbing the, again, if you have to reach in there, grab the mouth and the tongue and lift that up. Put in your oral airways, MPs your nasopharyngeals and all that stuff to help out. Big tongue, small airway, the trico cartilage there, um, that's usually the, the place for um, blockages versus the adults. You know, just different. And then from there, the other aspect, you know, when you start drawing your lines through everything for accesses, I'm going to talk about that right now. Obligate nasal breathers, diaphragm breathers, abdominal breathers, um, weak accessory muscles, 
um, and then you know what is deemed an increased respiratory rate. You know, 30 for a four or five year old is normal. Okay, now a four or five year old that's breathing 60, mm, it's a, there's an issue. Okay. So respiratory failure, leading cause of death in pediatrics. Okay, they don't die from sudden cardiac arrest. They don't die from STEMIs. Okay, they die from lack of oxygen. Correct. Yep. Anything and everything that that causes the, the lack of oxygen. All right. So in the abdomen, they don't have as much abdominal muscles. Um, they're missing the linea alba. Um, so they're you can you know. Walking on my little five, six month old, I can go and push on his belly. You know, you can feel anything. Uh, I feel the poop, I feel the, the liver, the spleen. You can almost you know, push back far enough and feel the spine and all that stuff. Um, they get a big liver, big spleen, and all that stuff, which that's, you know, for accident wise, except for the head and the abdomen, you know, blunt injuries that really takes the effect because they have such huge livers and spleens and all that stuff. Not as developed, uh, age of eight, that's how the brain is working. So I think my dad screwed me up a little bit when, I was, when he was giving me beer at four. Maybe, maybe not. Um, increased risk of damage um, for the aspect, I don't know how it is out here, but in Toledo, you know, one of the things that they really, they check by the age of nine months with lead screening and all that stuff. Um, some of the lead plants out there, you know, all the homes that were lead-based paint, you know, things to take into consideration. So if kids, if you walk in there, and, they, and I'm not talking about I don't have milestones or in here or anything like that, but, you know, things to take into consideration, okay? When should a kid be able to sit up? Six months, okay? When do they start rolling over? Three to four months, okay? So sitting up, or start rolling at three to four, sitting up by six. When do they start pulling up? Eight, nine months, okay? And then walking, a year, okay? So those are one of those things when you get into your sample history and the questions and to be asking, okay? But you got a little toddler, you know, he's two, but he's not, you know, not walking, why, okay? Things to be asking questions and all that stuff. Other that information. Extremities, um, they have small phones. The growth plates don't um, really, until uh, about the age 17, 18, um, is when most of the growth plates are start or fuse. Um, and then the IO access, um, getting into the anterior proximal tibia. I um, did hear a lecture today, I'm going to send to Chief. Um, where they actually talked about doing IOs in the distal femur um, as one of the places, the lateral distal femur for little ones. Yeah, as another potential spot and all that stuff. Correct. Yep. Skeleton again, um, they have more connective tissue. Uh, uh, the bones are, um, the, sorry, the connective tissue is stronger than the bones. Um, so they don't strain or sprain, they break more. Um, and then, of course, depending on what type of fractures, when we talk about the non-accidentals, the locations, green strict fractures and all that stuff. Um, usually a, a force, you know, if it's a nice clean break, it, there's a lot of force involved with all that stuff. Skin, thin, elastic, um, usually or from the aspect, they're like the uh, adults, um, they have the skin as the largest organ of the body, um, but it's also from the aspect they have small body mass, lots of skin, um, so they don't have the ability to control their temperature um, and all that stuff. So they cool off real fast or they heat up real fast. There's so much truth in that if you're not a parent. And three o'clock, and four o'clock, and five. All right. Any questions on anatomy fits? Again, a lot of it's just kind of sort of review to kind of sort of remember you guys to remember and all that stuff going, oh, crap. All right.
So infants, first year of life, um, they anything and everything is physical stimuli. They want to see, they want to touch, they want to feel. And where does everything go? In the mouth, except for food. Um, that's actually one of the Facebook talk about Facebook there. Um, my wife showed me she's like, you know, if it's food, it goes. Don't want it in the hair, the clothes, all that stuff. Not food goes into the mouth. Actually, I need to find that to put it in here. Crying is their form of expression. Um, under age of two months, they have limited behavioral, they have brief periods. Um, they really don't have any social smile and all that stuff. They're there. 23 hours of their day is sleeping. The other hour is eating and pooping, all right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. And it's really from the aspect, you know, um, transportation, um, histories. So anything under two, if they're talking about fever, if the kid has a fever of any sort, mom says he feels warm, which they've actually done research on that mothers go, yeah, he kind of sort of feels warm. You know, they, they've actually done it where they're fairly accurate on their temperatures and all that stuff. So if mom says he has a fever, kid goes um, from the whole newborn fevers and all that stuff. Two to six months, they get a little bit of social smiles. They start tracking. Um, they have the cry, and then the, the rolling over and the sitting and all that stuff. Assessment under the six um, usually gives the kid to mom. Um, they don't use, they don't have as much a stranger anxiety, but mom can usually they can hold them. You know, it's easier to control and all that stuff. Teach, yeah. There's always factors of that. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Yep. And then actually with this EM rap that I was listening to today, um, one of the anxieties for the kid is actually the anxiety of mom and everything that you were just saying there. Examine the chest. Why do we want to do the chest and abdomen first? Make sure they're breathing. Okay. Correct. All right. So you want to know what the rate quality of the lungs and the heart is. Because once you start touching anywhere else, what are they going to do? They're going to freak out. They're going to start crying. And then their heart rate's going to get jacked up. Their respiratory rate's going to get, you know, it's going to get all messed up. So from that aspect, if you can go to the chest and lungs first, push on the abdomen, belly, and all that. Six to 12, they get a little bit more social. They have, they don't start with, you know, they know who mama and dada is. Um, they play with toys. Everything goes into the mouth. Um, and then they become, you know, start becoming mobile, crawling, moving, pulling up, cruising, all that. Uh, caregiver, um, let them, you know, if you have time and if the kid doesn't look bad, if you need to, let them have your stethoscope. Okay, they, oh, okay, I don't want it. They put it in the mouth and they, oh, okay, it doesn't taste good, you know, and then give it back. And then, you know, again, building that repertoire or the early, uh, ability to, to examine the kid, um, and then the head to toe or toe to head exam. Um, and again, they don't want you to come into their face first because what do they fear? Us. All right. So if you pinch on the toes, play with the knees, tickle them, they give them, they start going giggling, laughing, and all that stuff, and it makes things a lot easier. Terrible twos. Mine's already there. Um, they don't like separation. They don't like being restrained but they're easily distracted, okay? Most parents nowadays have smartphones, and on the smartphones, what do they have? They have all the games. The kids know that, okay? Um, that or movies or whatever, um, which so parents become can be our allies when it comes this age time period. Lots of ability, they're curious, they have opinions. Mine's just learned the word no which is not a good thing for him. Um, they don't understand logic. Um, they do trial and error. Oh, you know, put the fork into the outlet. Uh, yeah, that's not a good thing, okay? Call that a self, yeah, it's, it's a self-correcting error. Uh, you hope. Yeah, see? <laughs> and that's my fear is I, th I think my, it's gonna be a couple of times before he figures that one out. Usually with the kids, start off with across the room, look at the, when we talk about the PATs and all that stuff in a little bit, 
um, get down the child's level, use play distractions and all that stuff. You know, really they like low because um, once you tower above them, they get intimidated, they get scared, and then they run away from you. Talk, reassure, explain, you know, the toe to head exam again, um, and then whatever hurts, leave that for the last. They don't want the ouchie. Preschoolers, three to six, they understand directions. They can they can tell you what hurts. They don't like to be again the pain. Let them have the equipment. Um, they with the whole aspect too there's, of the curiosity. From the school age, six to twelve, they have age of reasoning. You can talk to them like little adults. They should be familiar by this time with what the physical exam is. And this is where we start getting more into the head to toe exam and all that stuff. Misconceptions about their bodies, they don't like pain. I don't know how many times I've had, you know, the, the four-year-old where I just come in, no, ouch, ouch, that's going to hurt, you know. And then they, they ask you, you know, what's the one question they ask? Is going to hurt? And do I need a, do I, yeah. That's the first, I don't know how many times, walk in the room. Am I going to get shot? Am I going to need a, no, not right now. Maybe later. And then they, of course, um, when they get sick, you know, they want either mom or data. Some, yes. Somebody hold me. Just hold me. Speak directly. Simple instructions. You know, praise. Avoid ridicule. Two more kids. Two more baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Gestational diabetes, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Minimize lag time between, you know, the what's going on, performing any procedures. You know, if talking doesn't, you know, if talking fails if they don't like it, you know, sometimes you just have to resort to the papoos and, and restraining the kids. Adolescents, 12 to 18, the strong feelings, they like the privacy. Of course, they do understand pain and you can explain things, you know, nine times out of 10. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> My sister's a pediatrician and I, I tease her all the time. I'm like, kids are just little adults, you know, everything about them. They're just little adults. And she's like, no, they're not. Um, and it, it really are. But for the most part, you know, everything that we do, you know, everything stems back to BLS. We can't do anything. I can't do my job without you guys, you know, and all that stuff. Or back to the basics. All right. So ABCs come first on everything. This assessment, pretty much, we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the life threats? Do we need to stay in play, or do we have to load and go? All right. So when you walk into the room and we talk about the pediatric assessment triangle in a second, it's really from the aspect is, are we going or are we staying? All right. So the doorway assessment. What's the three parts of the pediatric assessment triangle? Book of breathing, or breathing part of it, yep. So before that, appearance, breathing, and ABC, so circulation. All right, so on the parents, how do they look? Are they sitting up? Are they laying down? Is it a one month old? Is it a five year old? You know, can they roll? Do they look cyanotic? You know, anything and everything. When you open the door, what's your first initial impression of that kid? Breathing side of it, okay? Can you hear them, you know? We know bad wheezing kids across the room, all right? It's the ones, the, the, the asthma kids that when you look at them, 
They got nasal flaring. They got their intercostal retractions. They're belly breathing, but you hear nothing at all. That's bad. Those are the, those are the kids that scare me. All right. Because those are the ones that are going to dump and crump real fast like. And then, of course, the circulation. What does the skin color look like? Cyanotic, you know, with cyanosis? Blue, ashen. Ashen's gray, okay. Paler, whatever, whatever, whatever. All right. So, what, so appearance, how do they look? What is their breathing? And then, of course, the circulation. All right. So, tickles, tickle me elmo, and all that stuff, general appearance. Tone interactiveness, are they consolable? Um, and then look, gaze, and then speech and cry. Um, and a lot of times, consolability is giving the mom and dad, okay, can mom and dad console them? Okay. If mom and dad can't console the child, guess what? It's time to go. Something bad. Okay. Um, and it's usually mom. If mom can't do them, you know, from that aspect. Um, and then, of course, the whole speech of crying and all that stuff. Work of breathing, we know that um, it's more informative um, than the absolute respiratory rate. So what are we looking at with the work of breathing? Rate. Retractions, okay. Retractions where? Intercostals, where else? Supraclavicular, okay. Diaphragmatic retractions, okay. And then the nasal flaring, all right. When kids start nasal flaring, they'll get retractions first. Nasal flaring is start getting into a late sign. Right? And then the head bobbing, exactly. Um, work breathe slow means that they're um, having problems with decomposition. Skin color, just some aspect of circulation, early sign. Um, so acrocyanosis, uh, which is you, sometimes you'll hear that word. They'll get their fingers, their nose, their toes. All that will be blue, but their core is nice and pink. Um, newborns are really known for this. For infants and toddlers and even kids, when is this a normal thing for them? Will they get their fingers and will they have the acrocyanosis? It's old, you know. June, July, they go to the pool. It's, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning for swim lessons. You, know, you get out, their lips are all blue and their fingers. That's a, a normal thing for them. Um, so don't always take into consideration of just that. Look at the whole appearance and go from there. Initial assessment, okay. AVPU stands for what? Okay. And how do we calculate a GCS? What's the three parts to the GCS? Okay. So how many points do you get for eyes? Four for eyes. Verbal, five. And then motor for six. Okay. So EVM is how I remember the mnemonic. So eyes, verbal, mouth, or sorry, eyes, verbal, motor, or, or movement, whatever. So top down, four, five, six equals 15. So even a rock gets a three. Okay. I've, I've seen people come up to me and say, yeah, he has a GCS of zero. I, okay. Okay. So dead, a dead person has a GCS of three. And for another day, breathing, of course, airway, did you hear sounds, you know, initial central, your central colors, and then talk about the skin color, cap refills, and all that stuff. But really the question is, what you're asking yourself, is it critical? Is it unstable? Is it potentially unstable? And then, of course, is it stable? A lot of mnemonics. So the critical side of it is really, do they have any problems breathing, circulating? Do they have a pulse? No pulse. Oh, crap. That is unstable. Got to go. All right. Are they breathing? Nope, they're not breathing. Oh, crap. Got to go. All right. Bad traumas, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest. Okay. That's your load and go. Okay. And the best drug for this situation, diesel. Okay. Oxygen and high flow diesel. Lots of it. On the unstable side of it, compromised, they might have some uh, breathing problems, the circulation, 
They might be a you know delayed cap refill, but they might be breathing, um, different uh, reasons, you know, from the, the injuries, respiratory, with your bad asthmatic kids, you know, the some of the trauma, you know, their hemorrhaging and all that stuff, leaving blood, um, your near drownings, unresponsive. Potentially unstable, error compromise, you know, they look good, but it's again, it's that mechanism of injury, you know. You know, they fell, you know, 15 feet from the tree, but they're running around. Well, is there a potential badness and all that stuff? You know, the high-speed car accident when everyone else in the car is dead, but the kid is, you know, shaking the rattle. Again, a lot of potential badness. <laughs> exactly. Minor fractures, pedestrian struck, but they look good. Um, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. And, of course, the stable. Kids look, look good. Everything looks good. You know, that's where we can, you know, stay in play and go from there. Get your sample history, get more of your information. So on the respiratory distress, appearance normal, work of breathing is increased, and circulation, okay, might be normal, might be a little bit cyanotic. All right. So on respiratory failure, so appearance, pale, okay, abnormal, breathing, Increase, decrease, problems. What? Can be either, okay. I got that one backwards. So it can be increased, and then of course the circulation can be abnormal also. Shock, appearance, normal, abnormal. All right. Breathing. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Breathing normal. And it's usually from the shock, it's from the aspect, it depends on what type of shock it is. Um, if it's just like a hypovolemic, septic shock and all that stuff, where their skin color they don't have, it might be pale cyanotic, um, but it can be abnormal. Right. So talking about shock from the aspect, um, sustained tachycardia is always a potential problem, delayed capital refills, with tachypnea. Yep, rapid breathing, um, and then from there, the per peripheral constriction, cold clam extremities. That's really what causes our cyanosis. Lay shock, weak pulse, decreased loss of consciousness, um, and then blood pressure. Okay. If you get a 15-year-old you know, that has a blood pressure of 70, good or bad? Bad, okay? So stuff like that, you know. Um, and again, going through the whole aspect of, you know, if you want to remember all the vital signs, please be my guest. I'll give you a pat on the back and a brownie. Right. Crafting kids, um, Braslo, um, that it was, you know, has been the, the tried and true method. There's some other things coming out now um, that's out there, the crash cards. Um, again, I just like my 1510 rule, which really helps out. and then. I can calculate everything else. Um, if you have smartphone users, um, there's a, a good app, um, Palm PD. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have and all that stuff. All right, so trauma. We know 89% um, from the is blunt penetrating as not as much. Unless you just happen to be living in Toledo, watching cartoons, and someone does a drive-by, that's always a bad thing. Leading cause of death for children, um, different than adults. Um, a lot of it's based upon mechanism of injuries and, of course, uh, patterns of injuries um, from the aspect here. Infants usually child abuse and burns. Um, when we talk about some of the things in the, the future, you can tell you know, what type of burn and how the burn occurred. Um, no, I just, you know, it was the water was hot or whatever. Um, and then, you know, toddlers, burns and drownings. Um, school age, as we start, they, they become more mobile. Um, and then adolescents, car accidents, because they're invincible. So from the aspect of an occupant, um, internal injury, okay, what year is this car? Okay, so we know now this is the one of the fractures that's called a chance fracture. 
So it's a T12 L1 fracture named after Dr. Chance who found it. Um, and what they did was kids, when they're, this is the whole reason why they have to have a shoulder harness now, because they're getting folded over and they're actually having a wedge fracture. Um, in that region, T12 L1 is, there's a, a um, one of the parasympathetic that helps you with urination and pooping. So when you fracture those, kids have problems with peeing and pooping later. That's the whole reason with chance fractures. Restraints, um, of course, the problems, um, you know, car seats, if they can't wear, you know, they should always be in the proper size car seat, booster seat and all that stuff, um, which I'm a huge stickler. Um, otherwise, if they're unrestrained, they become mobile projectiles. They hit anything and hit everything. On the pedestrians, there's what's called the three strike rule or the three hit. Uh, so what happens is you have the kid, they get hit by the car. Okay, so that's hit number one. From there, they hit the car. Okay, they bounce off the car, striking the ground. Okay, so hit number two. And then inside the, the skull or inside the body, everything gets jarred and, and jostled around. So that's the third hit. So this is one, kid hitting the ground is two, and then of course each thing shaking inside is three. And depending on where it is and, and all that stuff. Uh, most of the time with kids, okay, so cars coming at them, what do kids do? What? They don't, they freeze, okay? So adults will look into, they will actually turn and look into the vehicle. So that way you can know kids, they will either try to run or they freeze and they get the side impact and all that stuff. Falls, anything twice their height um, is always the biggest aspect. Um, I don't know how many times my kid's fallen off my bed and which is definitely twice his height. He's fine. Bicycles, helmeted, uh, just from the aspect, um, you know, if they're helmets, you know, when we fall, what do we try to do? Brace ourselves. What are we trying to protect? Our head, okay? Natural instinct. Anything and everything to, to protect the face and the head. So the cord, you know, the core, protect the core, protect the spinal cord, protect the head. Um, otherwise, it's unhelmeted. They get the scalps, these uh, the head injuries. Um, handlebar, um, internal abdominal, there's the aspect of what's called, you can actually have um, pancreatitis um, or injury to the pancreas from the, the handlebar injuries. Complication airways, more like with respiratory problems. Okay, so seat collar in place, the kids strapped down to the board, they can't move anything. And then like everything else, kids get scared. What do they do? They freak out, they're strapped to the bottom, or the, and then from there, they freak out. And then over time, what do they start doing? They're trying to get out, they're hyperventilating. When a kid starts hyperventilating, gasping for breath, what do they do? They puke on you, okay? So now they're on a the backboard, they can't, and they, you know, kids, they puke at anything. Exactly. Burns, rules of nines, of course, airway is always a huge thing, respiratory problems, um, and then, you know, pain management is a huge, huge thing for them. different ways that you can assess the burn patients. One's using the palm surface, okay? It's not your palm, it's the kid's palm, okay? Or the other aspect is the rules of nine. Child abuse, okay? We have an obligatory law, okay? If you suspect it, what should you do? Report it, okay? You don't have to confront mom or dad or anything else. You, and a lot of times, you know, when they come in, go in, and I tell parents, hey, by a law, you know, I have to, this looks like, okay, you know, something that's concerning. I have to let CSB know, okay? They do all the field checks, they do everything else, okay? You don't really make the parents uncomfortable and say, this just looks like something, and by law, we have to report it. 
okay? And then they can go from there. So typical, is the injury typical? What is the type? Do they have multiple injuries, multiple burns, different burns, patterns? And I'll show some stuff in a second. Um, is the caregiver behaving appropriately? You know, is dad pacing in the background, which I don't know how many times I've been on scene. You know, kid looks crap and dad's just pacing back and forth. Because he, you know that, the, you know, ultimately it is, you know, or you know, something like that. Or the the babysitter that, oh, everything's fine. You know, stuff like that. You know, drink and drug abuse. Multiple injuries, different marks, delay seeking care. You know, is the child clean appropriate weight? Uh, burns on hand and feet, which I'll show some pictures. Um, any decreased level of consciousness, you know, the rectal and vaginal bleeding, of course, is always a potential problem and concern from that aspect. Um, and then for you guys, you know, so much of the questions when you, you know, bring kids in, you know, especially traumas, I, you know, one of my questions, I want you guys, what did the home look like? What is all that stuff about? Or tell the doctors that. So when you get the um, cotton glove, you know, the, um, the, or the stocking glove and all that stuff, the burning, or this one, you know, from the aspect where you, where you have the uh, saving with the skin folds, you know, that kid is drawing the legs up because they're trying to get out of the water. Okay. This one, what's this? What? Beating with what? Switch or belt, the cable. You're, you get the, the circular marks, the cords of the cable and all that stuff. And of course, screaming is not always. Uh, uh, there is, um, have you guys ever heard of cupping or coining? Okay, so what's cupping? Okay. What else? Are, what else? What's some other potential things with cupping? So a lot of times what they do is actually they'll take a glass cup, they'll heat it, put a match on the inside of it, so it heats, and they'll put the cup, not the, you know they'll take the match out or the lighter, and then they'll put the and so you'll see a whole bunch of rings on the kid, um, and what supposedly it's you know trying to draw all the the nasty out. Or the coining, where they'll take the coins and they actually they'll strip the back and the arms and all that stuff. Okay, yeah, it's a ritual thing. So to take in a lot of Hispanic, um, this is you know, common Hispanics and all that stuff. So something to take into consideration. This is better with a Michigan, where he's you know, a little Michigan kid. Sorry. And you know she did it. All right. Kids, they eat everything. They will try anything. Okay. Accidental, 75%, under 5. Um, once you get into overdoses of the adults and all that stuff, uh, adolescents, teenagers, you know, it is, you know, suicide until proven otherwise. Common things, okay, they know that this tastes good. Oh, yeah, by the way, that looks just like that, okay? Um, this is why, you know, um, antifreeze and all that stuff, you know, they, again, it tastes good, um, and they will drink it. Funny looking, anything on the floor, batteries, I don't know how many batteries I've helped get rid of. Sometimes it's like, it'll poop out. Remove safe environment, controlled airway, circulation. Are they have any problems with the myocardial? From the aspect, you know, what history, what do you guys want to know? If you get called to a scene for ingestions, what, what should you be asking? What it was? How much? When? Yep. Okay. Correct. Correct. All right. Yeah. Bring the bottle with you. All right. What? Well, how much? Are they vomiting and causing coughing, seizures? Are they altered? You know, 
uh, bring, why don't we do Ipecac? Okay. So if it burns going down, what's going to happen? It's going to burn coming back up. Okay. That's why we don't do milk or anything like that or the whole thing. They drink acid, so I'm going to give them some alkali. We're not, you know, we're not playing pharmacists. You've been the one, huh? <laughs> so what is Skittles party? Farm parties? Do you know what it is? Have you ever heard of it? Oh, yep. Yeah. You'd be amazed at how many I've, when I do my street lugs and I talk about Skittle parties, they're like going, what? They do that? Yep, they do that. Yeah. So ABCs, don't forget your coma cocktail, um, your you know, dextrose, oxygen, you know, Narcan, and thiamine. Um, charcoal, um, from the aspect, we're not really doing charcoal and it's out of the guidelines now. Um, it's purely from the aspect, give charcoal, what do kids do? They're not gonna drink it, or if they do drink it, what happens? It pukes. It's gonna be all over the back of your ambulance. Okay, so now I have a kid that's puked, that has a black mouth, and now it starts having respiratory problems. Who wants to intubate that kid? Right. Exactly. Bring it. Bring the patient. Treat the patient, not the poison. This is a nice play on words. Kidnapping versus kid. Yeah, okay. Temperature, fevers. Okay. It's not a disease, it's a sign of something. All right, so in kids, what do we kind of sort of, what's the fever cutoff? What 1.5, okay, what age? What? Two, three, four, five, somewhere there, okay? Um, I even go up as high as 104, okay? So if you have a kid that's 103.5, that's running around destroying everything, are we worried? Okay, so if we have a kid that's 100.5, but it looks like death warmed over. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, it's not always the, the temperature. Um, and from the aspect with the elusive ri temperature rise, um, 104 in, ch in child, an infant less than three months, anything over 100.4 is deemed a needle natal fever. Okay? And these kids, they get tapped, they get lines, they get labs, they get x-rays, and potentially stay in the hospital for 21 days. Been there with my kid. Not a fun time. Nothing. 21 days of antibiotics for nothing. Hey, that's what happens you go to when you have a temperature of 100.8 at day number three of life. How do they look? How high is the fever? Does the kid look good? Are they listless weak? You know, are they, you know, from the aspect, are they consolable, not consolable? You know, kids that are talking, playing, all that stuff. Um, aspect of you know asking have you given anything Tylenol ibuprofen you know um, aspirin's no longer because of the rise syndrome um, and then some of the parents of course they're still doing temp and bath um, I've still had kid, you know parents with you know I use the alcohol rub them down with the alcohol and all that stuff there's still a lot of, of wise parents and all that stuff out there yeah, exactly and it doesn't Dehydration uh, for kids, the aspect, this is why um, two things that parents bring their kids to the ERs or for you guys, pain, okay, and then dehydrations and all that stuff. Um, for diarrhea and vomiting, 10, all right. Um, I don't know how many times, how many, how many about the diarrhea? Oh, they had one. Oh, they had two. And they're, you know, breaking everything in the ER. Uh, Exactly. So from there, why did they use 10? It was arbitrary. Um, things that we kind of sort of think about though, once they get above 10, are they having electrolyte imbalances? They start pooping out um, all the bicarb, um, potassium problems, um, and then 5% for your kids. Once they potentially lose 5% of their body weight, um, can have a lot of issues for them. Because remember, okay, how much does a, a, a kid, how much food do they have? 
12 ounces for a newborn, okay? And a nine, 10 year old has how much? A liter. So they have between 12 ounces and a liter. So take that into consideration. Eval, again, from the acid cardiopulmonary evaluation of the dehydration and get the history. What does it look like? Is it bilious, which is what? Yep, okay. It's like neon yellow color, non bilious. Um, is it bloody, blood tins? Is the diarrhea? Um, how much? Is it watery diarrhea? You know, voluminous, how much? You know, it's, you know, comes out the diaper, down the car seat, down the, you know, and it's, you know, falling out the car as we're driving down the road. There's a lot there. Okay. Bloody diarrhea and all that stuff. That's a bad day. <laughs> Focus history, of course, from the aspect of the abdominal uh, tenderness, um, anything for focal infections, um, estimate the urine output. So kids, if they're still in diapers, how many diapers a day? Four to six, okay. So four to six wet diapers a day, what they should be using. So one of the, again, those questions that really gives your mom says, well, he hasn't peed in eight hours, or he's only had one diaper in the past 24. Mm, that's a bad sign. Uh, and then, of course, ask mom, dad, what they've done. <laughs> uh. So asthma. <laughs> it's all perspective. That's that's a, a good perspective. Maybe the kid was playing around. I like that. You know. All right. So asthma. Three things that causes asthma. Environment. Okay. What are the environment and all that stuff causes with the, within the body? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So within the, within the body, the three things that we treat for. Okay. So bronchial constriction. Okay. What? It's me. Okay, which that goes along into the bronchial constrictions and all that stuff. All right, but histamine also causes what? You twist your ankle, what happens? Swells. That's a histamine. That's histamine release. Yep. So you get edema. Okay. And what do as what are they trying to cough up? Phlegm. Okay. So you get the bronchial spasms. Bronchial constrictions and all that stuff. We get the bronchial edema. It's all pissed off in there. Okay. You get histamine release, which in turn causes edema. And then they get the mucus plugging. So normal airway, muscle contractions, basically all the smooth muscles or all the muscles of the lungs um, in the bronchial are smooth muscle, um, which has the, the beta activations. And then you get swelling and mucus plugging. That's what throws the kids into the uh, bad exacerbations and all that stuff. Dyspnea, nasal flaring, tracheal tugging, accessory, and then any of your retractions, which we talked about that. Right. So how do we treat it? Estrogen. What? Okay, albuterol. And for EMT guidelines, diesel potentially. How much albuterol can you give? One what? What's a what's a treatment? So under ten kilograms or over ten kilograms is the first question that you have to ask. So if it's under ten kilograms, what's the dose albuterol? What? 
that's for at epipen. So under 10 kilograms, 1.25 milligrams of butyrol, over 10 kilograms, 2.5. Okay. And you can repeat how many times? Yep. Up, well, you can, you can repeat three. All right. But the scope of practice for the state of Ohio states what? If you're giving albuterol and the kid is not prescribed it. What must you get first? Mother may I? All right. So albuterols and all that stuff, your your guidelines. So from the aspect, if you're getting into the retractions, you probably have some little bit of nasal flaring, um, some retractions, bad kid there. All right. Treatment, oxygen, encourage coughing, intubate, bronchodilators. All right. So for paramedics, what else can you give? Activate and Yep, plasma. Epi? Uh huh. I'm telling you. Sorry, bedroll? Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. Well, the kid's dose is what? Yep. You, 0.5 to 1. Yep. All right. So, solid medrol, and then, of course, magnesium. 25 to 50 milligrams for that aspect. Um, and advanced EMTs, of course, you give you guys the after events in your guys' guidelines. Oh, oh. <laughs> not many people catch that. Broncos, again, the beta agonists, um, albuterol. Um, we do have anticholinergics, atropine or ipropion bromide, which are your Um From the aspect, all that doesn't wheeze, think about pulmonary edema or allergic reactions, you know, bee stings, hot summer day, you know, kids out playing around, you know, they got the hives, urticaria and all that stuff, um, pneumonias, and then any of her four bodies. You know, a two year or two month old, Three month old that can't get around, he got something inside his mouth, you know, and the little the, the toddler kid is running away, you know, think about that. Yeah, exactly. Or they shoved it inside. Rockalitis croup, this is the the time that we're seeing now. Big component is the pediatric. Um, triangle um, from the aspect with the respiratory. They look sick, but they're not really sick sick. Um, so they, you know, from that aspect, don't panic. Bronchitis usually caused uh, by RSV, uh, but there's a whole bunch of different, you know, players that do this. Um, and what it is, is you actually have upper airway trapping or, or constrictions um, and all that stuff. Um, these are the, the snotty nose kids. They have might have some wheezing, uh, might not hear any lung sounds at all. They look like crap. You know, they got a pulse ox of 90, you know, 92. You know, so the kids look bad, but they're like, gee, I feel great. Um, six months to three years, usually it's um, under age of one is the most common for these kids. Upper airways infection, gradual onset, you know, they can have extreme kidney, cyanosis, and all that stuff. And, and again, it's that kid that looks sick. You know, the one-year-old, and they got that, you know, snotty nose. It's a, it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, you can get x-rays and all that stuff. You'll see people signing, you know. But it's really, you walk up to the kid, yep. Once you see one, if you've never seen one before, you know, come over to my house, I can show you one. Um, and again, kids up until age of one, how do they breathe? Through the nose, all right? So the treatment for these kids are, is what? Suction, suction, suction. Okay. Piss the kid off. You gotta get the nose cleaned. Suction, 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 nose breathers. Um, if you need to, put them on some oxygen. Um, some kids do well, um, about 15 to 30 percent. Um, if they have family history of asthma, um, giving them a breathing treatment and all that stuff. So some albuterol.
God. Speak. <laughs> so croup, this is laryngeal trachea bronchitis. Okay, this goes a little bit lower down, so it's no longer the upper respiratory. Okay, and they have the seal marking cough. Who's heard this? Has not heard it. Okay, once you hear it once, you they get that. <laughs> okay, you can across the room. You can open the door, and the kid coughs, and they get that. It's character characteristic. Okay. Yep, they got croup. Okay. So how do we treat this? What's the home remedies for croup? Vaporizers. Okay. So taking the kid into the bathroom, shut the door, heat the bathroom up, okay, get the, the hot, moist air. Or some kids, you actually have to take them out into the cold weather. So the dry, cold weather. Don't know why it's the two polar opposites. Some do really well with the hot, cold, or the hot mist. Some do well with the cold, dry. Stuffy nose, upper respiratory airway becomes inflamed. That's what causes the marking. Um, they can get strider, which is that, you know, sound and all that stuff, which is really a bad thing. And, you know, medics, um, this is where you can do your um, nebulized epi and all that stuff to help. Sorry. Um, then, of course, the tachypnea. Epiglottitis, again, we're not seeing this as much. I think I've seen two cases over the past several years. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is the kids that they'll have drooling coming out of the mouth. They can't see, you know. Um, so what's the one thing that we're taught with EMT and paramedic school? With epiglottitis, what don't you do? Don't lay them flat and nothing in the mouth. Don't look, you know, sit them up, keep them calm as much as possible. If you can have mom hold the kid, you know, anything to keep the kid calm. And then it's a lot of high flow diesel. And might even some, you know, jet A if you need be. Drooling, tripod positions, if they get bad enough. Uh, from their comfort, don't place anything, oxygen, and then transport. Kid crashes, kid crashes, okay? If they stop, you know, they become cyanotic, you know, what do we do from there? Ventilate them if you can't ventilate them. What? Intubate or strike, okay? Uh, knowing, you know, up to about the age of eight, you know, might just have to be a needle crike. So again, as EMTs and all that stuff, to be thinking about, you know, having a 14 gauge needle readily handy there, you know, for your paramedics and all that stuff with a, a 6.0 or a blade and all that stuff. Respiratory compromise, again, remain calm, reassure the child. Um, don't agitate them, avoid the IVs, avoid, you know, laying them flat, um, and then really give them to the the parents just let the mom and dad hold them, strap them all in the car seat, and then drive, drive, drive. So when called the soulable child, right, the soul bitch, a little demonic that I talked about. Strangulation, um, for some reason mom's hair falls off and wants to kill the kid. Um, they, they'll wrap around the kids or the kids will grab the hair. They'll get around the fingers, around the toes, around the penis. Um, and all that stuff. Open pins, this is the old days where they had, you know, diaper pins and all that stuff. So the pin was poking the kid. Anal fissures, of course, the batter, trauma, and all that stuff. Any forms of infection and misconceptions, testicular torsions, um, and then your colicky kids. You know, one, two months, they start bringing their hands to the eyes. You know, they look a lot of times you can see them and they uh, they've been in a fight or something and they're just scratching themselves so keeping their nails you know clipped teaching the parents on the memory of the honey so the soul bitch socks on hands <laughs> the seizures 
from that aspect, these are just really any interrupted um, electrical activities. The biggest with the kids, of course, is the febrile seizures. Uh, we don't really diagnose it in the field. You know, the kid has a fever, they have a seizure, seizure stops. Um, seizures can last up to 15 minutes with these kids. Um, they, they have what's called the generalized tonic chronic, so they go unresponsive, shaking the whole body, they pee themselves, they bite the tongue, they have everything. Usually by the time that you get to them, they might be still seizing. By the time they get to the hospital, what do they look like? They stop seizing, they look good, they're starting to perk up, okay? And we just watch them. It's not exactly the temperature, so you can have, it's how fast it gets up there. Right? They can have, a, they can go from 100 to 104 like that, and then that's what causes the seizures. Or they can have that slow, gradual increase, and they have no problems. Other things, febrile, number of seizures, what it looked like, any head traumas, of course, ask about diabetes with older kids, okay? Lack of blood sugar will cause seizures and all that stuff, so check your blood sugar every time. Give them oxygen, do they get any medications, headaches? What's the particular rash? Yep, pinpoint red spots and all that stuff. And of course, don't forget your neuro exam, dehydration. Next question is, you know, the little kids up till age of two, they get the bulging fontanelle. It's, you know, almost looking like a geyser that's going to come out. Actively seizing, you know, protect them, don't restrain. Um, and then advanced antiseptics, what can we give? What? Versed or? Advan, if we have it, Advan has to be in a refrigerator. So not a lot of crews, Valium, okay? So from the aspect of Versed, okay, if you can't get an IV in, how can we give it? Nasally, up the nose and all that stuff. I am injection, put it up the butt, I don't care. Management, ABCs, vascular aspects, if you can, check blood sugar, um, and of course treating that, and then fevers and, and cooling them down. All right. So for seizures, it's the lack of oxygen that causes the death, brain death. Unfortunately, I've seen this a lot in our, our profession, all that stuff. Febrile, again, usually under the one month of age with fever, is a, uh, we look at um, doing lumbar punctures and CNS. These are why all these kids under the age of three months should go to the hospital because of this reason. Okay. Correct. So it is immunologic age. Okay. And that's really what we're, we take into factor. Okay. So it is what would they be at their, so it's their premature age plus they're out of gestation. Now, if they get beyond the two, what they would be two months beyond their gestation, what their normal gestation, then they're good. So if they're, if they're premature, they're still immunologic premature. They could be three months old, but be three months premature, and they're immunologically day zero. So, yes. Because the fineness isn't working properly and all that stuff. Present seizures, of course, just from the aspect with the febrile seizures, less than 15. This is a simple generalized. They get one in 24 hours, no previous. Complex, more than 15 minutes. They get a couple over 24 hours. They might just have a focal seizure, shaking an arm, um, and then some, some previous um, neurologic problems and all that stuff. The two different types of febrile seizures. This is the more common one, which is simple. Usually associated with the virus, last 15 minutes, again, once 24 hours. Treat the fever, don't really do much more than that. Send them home. Daycare, family history, 10%. If they've had a seizure, if they've had one before, guess what? Potentially having a, a febrile seizure, they're gonna have again. 
Um, and then the neonatal time periods and all that stuff greater than 30 days put them at higher risk. Males, sorry guys, were the weaker sex. Treatment, reduce the fever, OBS, and then treat the cause of the fever. Not much more. So, going back to the prep and all that stuff. So practice, practice, practice. Prepare. Okay, give you guys scenarios. You know, that's what drill time is for and all that stuff. That's my buddy. That's the oldest. Let me get new pictures. Any questions? <laughs>